for process-based models of macro positioning data evolution. Uh, my name is Joseph Weta, and I'll be giving the first talk uh, in the spotlight session. I'm really excited at the lineup of speakers um, we have today. And I want to start off by talking about kind of our goals when we're doing um, macroevolutionary studies of trade evolution. And I think, you know, uh, uh, going to this uh, tempo and mode, you know, harkening back to G.G. Simpson's goal of understanding, you know, where do we see variation in the tempo and mode of, of evolution across the tree of life? Where do we see variation where some things are evolving fast, some things are evolving slow, some things are evolving under this pattern and over under this pattern? And I think our goal there is really understanding the drivers of macroevolutionary change, right? And so how do we better connect it to the process of evolution that we really understand at the microevolutionary scale or through our studies of evolution at, uh, from, uh, through other uh, means? Um, but before I get into how we do this, I want to take a page out of my former postdoc advisor, Luke Carmen. He would often like to start a talk with a movie reference. Uh, I don't have the attention span for movies, so I'm going to uh, start with a television reference. Um, there's a show called The Good Place. Um, I like it. It's a pretty good show. Um, it examines uh, the nature of morality and how we assign good and bad uh, to people. In particular, the, the basic premise of the show is that there's four recently dead humans um, who have entered the afterlife after being on Earth. And they learn lots about uh, the nature of reality that wasn't apparent to them when they were on Earth. Okay? And they're guided through this process by a supernatural being played by Ted Danson, named Michael. <laughs> and Michael explains to them that the things they perceived on Earth aren't the way that they really are. Okay. And so one of those things that he describes is time. So, of course, we experience time as a linear phenomenon, but he explains then that time isn't actually linear, it's linear to a being that exists in, in the afterlife, that it actually is a Jeremy Berman. Now, what is a Jeremy Berman? You might think it's Jeremy Bolton's long lost brother, um, <laughs> but what, it, what he explains is, is that it's really just the name Jeremy Berman written in person, and this is what time actually looks like. It's not linear, instead it's these loop-de-loops going all around and coming back around. Now, as you might imagine, the characters on the show who have been existing on Earth struggle with this. In particular, um, one of the characters points out at this point, the dot of the eye, what does that represent? It's not connected to anything. To which Michael says, well, that represents Tuesday, sometimes July, and sometimes never. <laughs> so, what I'm going to talk about in this talk is what if macroevolution is like Jeremy Berry, okay? It's this complex underlying process that we perceive some data, some, some parts of it from, but how are we going to truly represent something so complicated and something so convoluted that's going on underneath? Can we represent this with our models that we use in phylogenetic comparative methods, which are normally for discrete traits, these sorts of Markov models and these sorts of Gaussian models for continuous traits like Brownian motion or ornstein willenbeck process. So how do we go about capt better capturing this underlying Jeremy Berry? Well, when we do comparative studies, we have a process by which we get data, we get a phylogeny, we measure and compile our traits, we use a phylogenetic comparative model, and we interpret our results. And I would say that in the last few decades, we've really been focusing most of our attention on developing and implementing novel phylogenetic comparative models that better incorporate this underlying Jeremy Berry, this process that we have limited access to, and uh, improve our model fits from these very simple caricatures that uh, form the basis of our, you know, base models. But a, a few years ago, there was a symposium at Evolution called the Dark Side of Phylogenetic Comparative Methods. It's been brought up a couple times um, at the meeting so far. And I think that the, the fundamental problem that was being faced then, and still continues to be uh, faced now, is that we hit this wall with just developing more and more uh, sophisticated or complicated models that I think you know, is kind of the event horizon of macroevolutionary modeling. 
that if we get data that's so, uh, uh, or if we have models that are so complex, like a Jeremy Jeremy, can we really estimate that process using comparative data alone when we have a limited set of species that um, and we're not going to get more very easily, right? So um, how can we actually access that, right? We get this wall of knowledge. So we just give up and say we can't learn anything about that macroevolutionary process if we're studying a clade where that process applies only to that clade. And there's only 30 species in our statistical tests tell us we need you know, 10,000 species, right? What do you do? Well, as we've mentioned at this uh, conference already, there's a, a nice spotlight session run by uh, Rosanna Zanil Ferguson and Michael Landis, where they highlighted the bright side of phylogenetic comparative methods. And I think that the way we've uh, dealt with this uh, sort of event uh, horizon is to try to incorporate more knowledge of process into our models when we analyze uh, our data. And so when we look at uh, the spotlight, the spotlight session in the titles of the talks uh, that are included, um, you'll see that there's lots of talk about incorporating process-based models, new models that ref better reflect the underlying processes, incorporating things like interspecific competition, short and long-term uh, phenotypic evolution, population genetic models, and measurement theory. And these sorts of things can help inform what we're doing so we're not just uh, blindly searching around for uh, the underlying Jeremy Barony, but we actually bring some information in. But before we get to talking about the importance of considering process when analyzing your data, I want to talk about something that I used to not think about at all, which is the importance of considering process when you're measuring and defining your character. So the very first step of asking um, what are we going to study and how are we going to measure it and define it. And I think comparative methods has a very tight relationship with systematics, from uh, which we share a lot of our data, our models, um, and you know, trees, trade data, everything. Um, we often are both comparative methods people and systematists. Uh, so there's a lot of communication between these. And I think it's revealing to kind of look at the history of how these uh, fields have communicated and how we think about things here and the questions we ask here and how that is translated to how we do things and think about things that, uh, with comparative methods. Okay, so just to kind of get to you know a little uh, you know a, a history uh, of uh, you know the models we use in systematics, you know you can go back to or uh, we can look at statistics where we look, have a model of parsimony, and our goal is really to define synapomorphies, right? Homologous characters that are the defining uh, uh, characters of clades, and homoplasy indicates mistakes in homology. When we uh, went to statistical phylogenetics for DNA, we have a model that's these continuous time Markov models, so like a GTR model or a Duke scanner model, and we align homologous DNA sequences and assume the sites evolve according to this process. Homoplasy is an expected outcome to be modeled um, um, and not really uh, that big an issue. But when we deal with statistical phylogenetics on phenotypes, we apply the same sorts of models. And often the first step that we do when we make these data sets is that we align homologous phenotypes. And to me, this kind of feels like a bit of a hybrid approach to defining the, the homology. Do we, how do we expect homoplasy? If I ever want to get confused, I just have conversations about homology with folks. I don't know if you've ever had that experience. But I think, you know, from a systematic perspective, you want to build this phylogeny. For many comparative questions, we actually don't want homology at all. Right? So if you're thinking about modeling uh, the evolution of flight, as was uh, pointed out by Madison Fitzjohn in this really important paper, um, you actually want multiple independent replicated events of this non-homologous flight if you want to explain that by, say, habitat or climate change or something like that. Those are the sorts of things that drive the evolution of flight. What you don't want is that you know, synapomorphy of a clade that's only occurred once Right? It is defined as the uh, you know, homologous within everybody in there, but it's just one thing that happened. It doesn't tell us that this is a general process that drives the evolution of these uh, characters. So my thesis for this talk is that in order to find a trait, we actually need to consider the process by which we expect it to evolve from the very beginning. Okay? 
And so I'm going to use a little example that's well known, um, and that is uh, the, uh, dealing with continuous traits and morphospaces. This is going to be groundbreaking. Um, but it's really inspired by these two papers, um, this measurement and meaning biology by uh, David Houle and colleagues, and this uh, paper by David Pauly on developmental dynamics and G matrix. GDs can morphometric spaces be used to model phenotypic evolution. And I'm going to ask you a simple question. Which of these species evolves faster? Okay? An elephant or a mouse? Okay? Now you might say that's an empirical question, right? Which is true. But it also depends, your expectations are going to depend on what I, how I measure this and how I define it. If I measure linear scale values and I say there's a change of one kilogram, which of these is more likely to evolve a change in one kilogram? Probably the elephant, right? So by that definition, elephants evolve faster. However, we know we should probably log transform body size traits. And the reason is, is that the changes on the log scale correspond to a percent change, say plus or minus 1%. And then if I say which of these is more likely to evolve that much, you're probably going to tell me, I don't know, right? <laughs> the rates are probably pretty similar, all else being equal. If they were different, what could you say? Well, maybe there's something interesting about mice having shorter generation times, or elephants sampling more different habitats because they travel more about more places, right? Maybe there's something ecological that explains the difference in rates. And the reason for this choice, the reason we prefer the log scale for these questions is that it's based on our understanding and theoretical context for how we understand biology works, right? So if we think about like the breeder's equation, how evolutionary change happens, it's based on biological variation and the functional consequences. And we expect both of these scale geometrically with size. The consequences of like being plus or minus one kilogram are very consequential for a mouse, but not very consequential for an elephant by comparison. And we also expect new mutations to increase plus or minus 1% more than they're going to increase, oh, I have a mutation that makes me one kilogram even if I'm a bacteria. So, but what's important to remember is that neither of these conclusions are wrong, and if interpreted correctly, we could have the same meaning from both. We could say that elephants evolve faster by measuring linear scale traits, and we could design a comparative model that captures this, which is we could have the rate of evolution depend on the size of the organism, so trait-dependent rates of phenotypic evolution. But the problem with this is that it complicates things, right? The header, if you see differences between clades, is that because they're just different sizes, or is it because they actually have different processes going on? If we go instead to the log scale, then our expected model is constant rates, all else being equal. And that heterogeneity among clades, variation in tempo of mode, is very likely to map on to things that we're actually interested in, like changes in ecology, changes in genetic architecture, or whatever the, uh, if the case may be. And so it's this theoretical context that I think uh, defines the uh, normal evolutionary process and our, and our choice. And what we really want to do is isolate those causes of interest into our model so that we can actually identify and, and, uh, un, un, and see those uh, causes of heterogeneity that are interesting to us. And I've written about this sort of topic before. Um, so a couple years ago, um, I published a paper with uh, Danielle Caetano and Matt Pinnell, where we talked about uh, com uh, how principal components analysis is a statistical technique that can, uh, you know, it's a very straightforward technique. But when we use it to de determine which traits we're going to study, like which ones are interesting, we can bias the models that are going to come back, right? Because we're letting statistics pick our traits for us, and this can kind of mislead our model fits and inferences. And this is something that happens quite a bit, as this paper by the colleague pointed out, is that we can have these relatively continuous processes occurring uh, underlying our traits, but they're filtered through these dynamic developmental uh, interactions and result in these kind of discrete entities that um, if we don't understand, you know, you can have continuous transitions between these, we're going to uh, observe you know, rate shifts in, in evolution, or we're going to see heterogeneity when the underlying process is actually continuous. Right? And so you can think of these as like you have characters on a vertebrae or something, and you're trying to find homology among different species that have these different vertebral numbers, they have different you know, homology, it's really hard to find, 
And so it's very easy to make a model that says, oh, look, this plate's speeding up, when it really is just a continuous uh, normal change in phenotype uh, through uh, this underlying space, this underlying air environment. So what we have here is this you know, uh, underlying process that may be continuous, and we have our observed states. And we think about how uh, a population can move through these things. In some cases, it may move very quickly if it's on this kind of smooth part of the Jeremy Baramy, or it can move very slowly if it's on this very complicated part of the Jeremy Baramy. And Lord help us if it ever jumps to the eye. Um, <laughs> what do we do? Um, you could argue that's happening. So my former postdoc, Sergei Tarasov, um, has been trying to address how we deal with these sorts of things. So uh, Sergei just left. He was a now starting position at the Finnish Museum of Natural History. And he published this paper in Systematic Biology that came out this year. And it's a very, uh, 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 this paper has a lot in it. Um, and I think it's uh, a really important paper for understanding how we're going to deal with this underlying complexity. And so the title is, Integration of anatomy ontologies and Evo Devo using structure, structured Markov models suggests a new framework for modeling discrete phenotypic traits. And his solutions for dealing with um, the kind of complexity that emerges is to use what are called structured Markov models. And so these are models where we build in the known anatomical dependencies among traits. So your finger is part of your hand, is part of your arm. You have to lose your arm, you're going to lose your hand and finger. You don't want to reconstruct a floating finger of that in the tree of life. And by incorporating hidden state Markov models. These are unobserved states with the same observable states. So these are different parts of the Jeremy Baramy that all come back to the same observed color, right? And with these two solutions, uh, he was able to resolve the long standing Madison's tail color problem, which is when you're faced with a character like this where you have three species that are tail absent, tail blue, and tail red. How do you properly code these characters? Well, I could go into detail into all your different options. You probably can imagine some different options. You can code it as one, two, or three different characters with uh, you know, absent present, absent blue or red, or you know, missing states, inapplicable characters. There's lots of different choices you can make to coding these characters. And they can lead to different outcomes when you run it through your statistical Markov model, right? So what do you do? Well, it turns out you can use these structured Markov models with hidden states, and that unites these and provides a proper framework for understanding the evolution of these traits and resolves uh, the Madison tail color problem. And so you might be thinking, well, what do these hidden states represent? Well, they could ch represent changes in, say, the genetic architecture or the developmental architecture of those traits. They could represent a change in the environmental context, maybe things are evolving faster in a certain habitat uh, versus another. Or it may represent something a little less interesting. So I've been a part of this uh, Phenoscape project. Um, and uh, we're actually running a workshop tomorrow that has some space for, for uh, walk-in folks. If you're interested, come talk to me. Um, and you can get, uh, this is probably going to look very familiar to people in the empirical world, where if we look at a particular trait, so this, we sort of buried for a cog fin, and we got all these different phenotypes. So these are different phenotypes that are annotated to species in the Phenoscape database. Um, that have been reported in the literature. So we have this uh, uh, structure called the urineural, and we have various different phenotypes that have been described. So increased length of urinal 1, decreased size, urinal 1 absent, urinal 2 elongated, urinal 2 increased length. You kind of get the sense that these aren't all just totally different, right? But like all of these are affecting the overall size of uh, the structure, right? And how are we going to put this in a character matrix that we can actually analyze. How are we going to divide this up into you know, 0 or 1, character state 1, character state 2, character state 3, right? And there's a lot of options, right? And so what we can end up happening is uh, what Sergei has called the two scientist paradox. And I'm going to illustrate this with these um, uh, two different, or this, this set of phenotypes that you might observe among species. And you can have circle or triangle, and you can have red and blue. And suppose that these are underlined by uh, two different developmental modules, right? They're totally independent. You can 
switch on triangle, you can switch on circle, and you can switch on red, and you can switch on blue. And we have two scientists studying these traits. Scientist number one uh, thinks that there are these four states and codes them as two independent traits, the color and the shape. Scientist number two, however, is particularly interested in red triangles because they think that red triangles are a key innovation for the evolution in their claim, right? So they can uh, assign this variation as red triangles and in another state for everything else, right? And they fit Markov models to this. Scientist number one, um, who identified these four different states, can reconstruct each state independently and get the correct number of transitions and the correct model, and also reconstruct them jointly and finds no evidence of hidden states, no evidence of heterogeneity in rate or tempo and mode across the tree, right? Well, we simulated it that way, so that makes sense. What does scientist number two find? Scientist number two reconstructs it and says, okay, there's a transition here, but why isn't there transitions across this other part of the tree? And so they actually find support for a hidden state model with four states, okay? And they reconstruct transitions here and here. This is the exact same model, right? But they find heterogeneity just because of how they coded their characters. So the heterogeneity was introduced by the observational process of not properly capturing the underlying developmental substrates. Uh, and it, accordingly, they find heterogeneity across the tree. Okay, so what does this mean? Well, so Sergey comes to me and he says, characters and character states are not different, they are identical. We can collapse them and uh, uh, split them apart using the structured Markov model with hidden states. And it doesn't matter, they're equivalent. We can study one character with its multi -state, a multi-state character, or we can split it apart into lots of characters that are all uh, uh, have their own states. And if we do it properly, they'll all give us the same answer. So when we're doing our systematic study, we just pick the coding that minimizes the heterogeneity of the fitted model, find the fewest number of hidden states. And this disturbed me deeply. <laughs> <laughs> but it's right, right? So for statistical phylogenetics, we only care that our characters actually evolve by a Markov model. We don't actually care about homology. And what disturbed me was this idea that we would have these like Frankenstein character matrices that we couldn't reject hidden states, but they didn't make any sense. They didn't make any biological sense, right? So, you know, these don't seem like very good characters to reconstruct a phylogeny, but this seems to be what uh, uh, Sergey's conclusion was telling me. But I think when we thought about this more deeply, we realized where we need to anchor this. So, you know, when we start questioning our characters, the floor kind of drops out in a way, and we don't have anything to anchor our models in. And so, we could define this space where we have, we can amalgamate characters together into, uh, uh, where we have, are lumping more and more different states into the same states, or we can split them apart into unique character states. And when we do that, in that process, all the other uh, a part uh, has to be soaked up by the model, right? So if we were to kind of look at this plot, what happens is we could have multiple non-equivalent uh, evolutionary states lumped together, and our model would have to have a lot of heterogeneity to account for that, right? It would have to explain, uh, and this heterogeneity would come from, we coded our characters wrong, but it would also come from ecology, it would also come from um, genetic architecture, all those different things that we're interested in. At this other end of the spectrum, we fully split our characters apart. Every dis uh, uh, difference is given a unique state, no lumping. Our model would, wouldn't have any heterogeneity, but we're not going to be able to estimate that. You can't give a unique character state to every single species, right? That is not going to be able to find a common mechanism. So we can think about kind of going up and down this uh, model data space and trying to find the combination where our characters are one step apart in expected evolutionary distance. This is like the log space for body size, right? And our model states represents changes in our target of inference. So if you're interested in ecology and you're interested in changes in the rate of evolution due to ecology, then you would want to incorporate knowledge about the genetic architecture in this part 
so that you don't pick up heterogeneity because of that, and vice versa if you were interested in genetic architecture and anthropology. And I think it's time to find and anchor this uh, combination of data and model space into the one that has the most meaning, and has the maximal mapping to the inferences we're trying to draw. So, how do we do this? Um, as I said, I think it's we have to anchor it in the knowledge of process and data. Um, one of the, I've, I've been um, telling this book that I've uh, read recently, um, it's, I, I think it has a lot of, uh, has changed the way I think about statistics and observational studies as we do with comparative methods. But um, this is Judea Pearl who says, we live in this era uh, when big data is presumed to be the solution to all our problems, but the one thing I hope to convince you is that data are profoundly dumb. If I can sum up the message of this book in one pithy phrase, it is, you are smarter than your data. Data do not understand causes and effects. Human do. Humans do. And so one avenue that I've been trying to pursue to integrate more human knowledge is by using these phenotypic ontologies. And these ontologies are uh, machine-readable uh, representations of concepts, categories, properties, and the relations between them. And so in collaboration with the Phenoscape group, uh, we can think of uh, traits like foot and tibia, these are parts of hind limbs. Um, the tibia is a bone, uh, the bone develops from a particular tissue, the hind limb develops from another tissue. These sorts of dependencies are kind of definitional. We shouldn't be asking our statistics to estimate these from the data. And so we've developed uh, pipelines for using this information to integrate the, our characters together and to properly model them using uh, this framework. And so uh, we have these papers in prep where we're uh, pulling together uh, characters and we can split them apart and amalgamate them uh, uh, constantly across this uh, uh, spectrum by using these ontologies. And, uh, and these are all the same inferences that we're getting. We're just looking at it at different scales and that's what we're allowed to do when we integrate these ontologies. So we can do things like look at different regions of the body and ask which is evolving faster, where are those changes occurring on the trees? So for mouth parts, there's lots of changes occurring all over the place. For wing venation, it's very static trait, and the changes are isolated just on a few branches. We can make these heat maps of which character or body regions are evolving more rapidly. So in these hymenopterans, the mouth parts and the forelimbs are evolving more rapidly than other parts of the organism. If you want to know how to do this, again, the workshop tomorrow. And I think these ontologies are kind of giving us this information that are helping us structure our Jeremy Barony, right? It's more information that we need to get this complex a process. But we have data on that. I want to highlight a particularly awesome talk I saw yesterday by Jesus Martinez Gomez at Cornell, where he was looking at this exact thing, where we were looking at the uh, uh, morphospace that's derived from model organisms to understand macroevolutionary processes in inflorescence of flowers. So, I think we can take this message from phylogenetics that uh, kept growing by incorporating molecular evolution and uh, population genetics, comparative met methods in order to keep growing has to incorporate more information from these other sources to keep growing and growing. So with that, I'd like to make acknowledgments and I'd like to have questions.